in studio with the birthday boy, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Good morning again, Rob. All of uh, 83, you said. 83. Huh? All good years. Everyone. That means I've known you since you were like 50 something or whatever, right? Because I think I knew time. you back in the 90s. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. The math is slipping. <laughs> <laughs> on, on me too. I turned 60 this year. Uh, our guest in this segment is Dan Lutz. He is a program board member for uh, Satellite 2023 and also in the Eastern Panhandle uh, Conservation uh, District as well, too. So we want a supervisor. Let's welcome in Dan. Good morning, sir. Well, good morning and a happy birthday, Bill. Well, thank you very much, Dan. And if I remember this accurately, too, a former WVU Mountaineer football player. A day or two ago. Yeah. What years did you play at WVU, Dan? That was in the 60s. Where you were a teammate with uh, Joe Manchin before he was a U.S. Senator. Yes. Yeah, come on. Closer to your microphone so we can oh, hear you there. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What was your position of choice? Well, I preferred linebacker. Mm-hmm. The Sam, the old Sam Huff tradition there, right? Well, somebody's got to do it. Somebody's got to tackle somebody. <laughs> All right. Hey, uh, first and foremost, I want to ask you about uh, this, uh, this Satellite 2023 Eastern Panhandle thing. You were mentioning it uh, to me last week when you stopped in studio, or earlier this week. What, what is that about? Well, briefly, and I'll hold this up for the camera. This is a magazine published by the organization called Via Satellite. Mm-hmm. And this uh, conference that I was talking to you about was a, an international symposium of about 400 uh, satellite communication, space research, and defense companies met at the convention center in Washington. And then the, it's an annual thing. And For my part, it didn't take more than about five minutes of listening to panel discussions before I was overwhelmed technologically. But there were a number of things that struck me as that should be of interest to West Virginia. And this has to do with getting Internet coverage in the state. Uh, Internet is a part of it. Um, I would start out with, and I'll share this with, with uh, I held, I'm holding it up for the camera, you really can't see. Mm-hmm. That advertisement is for an organization called Students for the Exploration and Development of Space. Mm-hmm. They are interested in affiliating with high school students, undergraduate students, and graduate students for the development and exploration of space. And this dovetails with the big multinationals such as Northrop Grumman, Ilius, Ilium, uh, JSAT, Intelsat, just to name a few, they, they were ta- discussing along with venture capitalists in their panel discussions that they do not have the time or the people to devote to the research as fast as it's coming on. And what they want to do is invest in people who are working in their basements, in their garages, in their attics, or wherever, developing these new programs, new techniques, things that have never been heard of before. And they want to invest in that. So this is especially of interest, and I'm going to I'm going to try to share this with the local school system to find out if they're interested in becoming affiliated with it because there's no reason that there can't be a student at Hedgesville or a student at Jefferson or a student at Berkeley Springs who might invent the next uh, communication specialty arbitrarily or, or something else. There was one thing that came out of the discussions was if any of us can imagine something it's being done right now. What we can't imagine is what's on the drawing boards. Mm-hmm. And it's it's fantastic. And I, I was chatting with Bill last week. The Israelis are talking about something that they've developed, and I don't have the details on it, but they can do surveillance of, uh, say, streams and determine not only if there's E. coli presence, but what present, but what kind of E. coli it is. Now, it used to be you couldn't even do that in the lab for, with certainty. Well, the Israelis are, say they're doing it with uh, 90% certainty. So uh, imagine what this means to cleaning up our water systems around the world, uh, uh, reducing pollution, uh, conservation, uh, it, the, it's, it's mind-boggling. 
to me anyway. Mm-hmm. But then, too, maybe I, maybe my mind is too small for things like that. <laughs> uh, one of the other things you made. Oh, go ahead, Bill. I was going to say, while you're uh, uh, looking, uh, Dan, uh, this came up a few years ago. We were working with U.S. Geological Survey, uh, the uh, water group in Charleston. Uh, there was a concern, a type and identity of E. coli. Uh, was it leaking from a sewer plant, from our failed sewer systems? Was it coming from uh, domestic animals? Was it coming from uh, wildlife? That was a very important consideration. If it's coming from the uh, failed sewer systems, failed septic systems rather, then we needed to put more emphasis on it because the E. coli is is a problem. We found at that time, Dan, uh, that there was, even though several companies said they could do type identification when you did the blind test to see if they were correct or not we could not do it so there was no good way this was as recent as 15 years or so ago no good way in the lab to tell where the source of the e coli was coming from so you're saying the israelis have a way of doing it for satellite now once again they 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 say they can i yeah. wasn't in a position to say no yeah, you can't yeah. and uh, because they put a whole lot more resources into it than i have yeah you also mentioned you thought it was uh, not the best strategy to try to hang fiber optic cable throughout the state. That satellite technology might be a better answer in West Virginia. Okay, more thing, more, uh, and just a few things that may illustrate the point to the listeners. Uh, in twenty twenty five, satellite communication will consume about one trillion dollars of actual expenditure which in this next year is going to result in the launch of at least 30,000, and that's three zero 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 satellites above the Earth for communication purposes from about 100 different corporations. Now, why are we wasting our money in West Virginia on obsolete fiber optic communications when these people are saying that within five years they will offer 5G broadband communication to any point on the earth from Barclays Square to Pitcairn Island for less than five dollars a month. Now why are we why are we wasting our money on that? on fiber optics. Has the technology improved enough? And I I ask you this because in typical surveys of internet experiences, most people, HughesNet for instance, if I've ever had direct TV, they provide satellite internet and most people grade that among the lowest in terms of customer satisfaction. That's satellite internet. And if I can add on to that same thing, how weather dependent? I think that's kind of what you're driving at. Yeah. How weather dependent are these uh, the satellites for radio frequency broadband? Okay. Frequency? How de- how reli- are you saying how reliable are they in in severe weather? Yes. Okay, that's interesting because in this magazine they also have numerous advertisements about hostile weather. I, I think I have the right one out. So these people are putting their money where their mouth is. In trillions of dollars. Well, yes, that doesn't really answer my question. Uh, do, have they? I'm sure they. There's data available if the reliability of satellite signals uh, in during severe weather. Uh, yes, is the answer because they, this it's obviously a problem that's significant to them, or they or they they wouldn't be working on it. So uh, they and they know they've got to overcome the severe weather limitations. Uh, yes, because Hughes, I have Hughes at home, and it's terrible. Mm-hmm. For instance, how obsolete? I am lucky to get three megabits download speed under the best of circumstances, whether it was from Frontier years ago or from Hughes now. Across the mountain in Loudoun County, Verizon is providing their customers four gigabits download speed. Now, if them, why not us? And along the lines of that, I brought another book with me. Uh, this is the book that's entitled Night Comes to the Cumberlands, 60 years old. And it is the book that gave rise to the Great Society and the War on Poverty. Oddly enough, it should be retitled Night Comes Back to the Cumberlands because everything being done in 
West Virginia, Eastern Kentucky and such, is so obsolete. We're, we, we've got, in, in West Virginia, we've got to get into the 21st century. And I, can, and, uh, I was the only person with a West Virginia address registered for the Satellite 2023 conference, much less being on the program board. And uh, I'll be part of the pro of the 2024 program. Uh, that what they're getting ready to do is just ab it's absolutely mind boggling to me. So, but Danny, what got you um, interested in your role as the conservation district supervisor um, to sort of morph into the Maria? The can whole. I share this with okay. You? Uh -huh. All right. Um, you know, for, to, okay. For, to, for, go it's, ahead. It's minor, uh -huh. but and and, ob and this is also obsolete. Uh, the days of Farmer Brown putting the plow behind the tractor and going out in the field and plowing all day—that's uh, that's that's nice to look at in hindsight and, and archaic, but it's pa it's past the days of operation. Okay. Now, there are the cut some of the custom cutters. Who harvest the grains? They start. They started in March in lower part of Texas, and they'll work into Canada through November and December. They have GPS systems on the combines that go from that. That they they simply keep going, and all you have to do is have a service truck to keep the fuel in them and take the grain away. And you act. They they keep an operator in them because of uh, uh, me mechanical problems, but the GPS monitors the speed. The rate of harvest, the quality of uh, of, of product taken in, and call, calls the trucks when they're if when they're needed to to service the machine, etc. That's uh, that's being done now. That that's twenty year old technology. So the thing, another thing that got me interested is once again satellite technology. When we had this infestation of the emerald ash borer a few years ago, I and mean, they're still around, unfortunately, killed one of my trees. Yeah, okay. the ash is not ash trees not around, but they, the the borer still well, around. The, yeah. the, <laughs> the seedlings are coming back. Yeah. That's one good thing. But the point being, we could take satellite photos and tell where the infestations are, and and then with a field of alfalfa, if I have a corner of spittlebug in uh, in in a uh, fifty acre patch of alfalfa. Should I spend $2,000 to spray for uh, the whole thing for insects? Or how about taking a backpack and going out and getting the infestation that's there? Uh, that's money in my pocket. So these are the things I'm interested in. Uh, down on the farm has got to come into the 21st century as well. Okay. I had to adjust Bill's camera. I, I was lost there. <laughs> your, your, your camera got looking at down. your <laughs> looking at your shirt buttons there. Yeah. Dan Lutz is our guest here on the program. Let's talk about the uh, your role as supervisor of the conservation district. Uh, what do we need to do here in the Eastern Panhandle legislatively in regards to the conservation district? Anything in spe uh, specifics? Well, to, to give them credit, the legislature has been very cooperative with our our programs. Um, Shall I say we always need more money? Mm -hmm. Now the here is the problem we're facing in the Eastern Panhandle. When I when I first got into the ag industry in the on the commercial aspect of it in '78, there were 212 operating dairies in Jefferson County. 212. 212. Now there's four. Yeah, I was going to say, I thought there maybe was three. So you said there's still four. That's good. Uh, there, that, well, and uh, yes, you're right, because um, I think of the name they've got. They, they went out, they, they sold, yeah, the Huffs sold their cows last year. So we so down to three out. then? Yeah, we're down to three. Okay. Uh, orchards. We had about 15,000 acres of orchard in Jefferson County. I don't think we have more than 4,000 now. Wow. Uh, so. Is this all due to development? Uh also, international pressure. That is, uh, you rem I'm sure you remember the Payment in Kind program and the Whole Herd Buyout of the 1983 uh, agriculture programs, where they pay they they paid uh, dairy farmers to go out of business, right. and they uh, paid and they paid grain farmers not to produce. That was a 
throw back to the old soil bank program of the 50s and 60s. Yeah, going to cattle very quickly, in 83, that was because of the disease, was it not? The mass wasting disease? That was deer, uh, but there's com- something comparable with cattle. Well, uh, the, that is mad cow disease was a problem, yeah. but that was in Europe more than in America. We, we, did, we didn't have, we had problems with it, but it wasn't as severe as in Europe and in, and in, in, in Africa. So to say that uh, whole herd buyout was because of mad cow, I don't think so. I think it was, economics was, was a bigger factor. They wanted to centralize the dairy production into a few large operations. That's called economy of scale. That's what I okay. think. Yeah. You, you, may, you may well be right, don't you? There was a small dairy not all that far from where I, dairy farm not all that far from where I grew up. Yeah. Uh, and it was kind of interesting because of a whole lot of development, businesses, main highway, and then tucked back behind there was a, a dairy farm that yeah. was still in business from, I don't know, years and years before. I, I don't think they, they're in business any longer. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Danny, what all does the conservation district do as, as supervisor? What are all the details that you have to be, be well, responsible for? Uh, one of the things we we had our, our, our eastern regional meeting yesterday, and then we've got our quarter of the meeting coming up this uh, this coming week. Uh, first off, uh, to go with the ag programs first, the the uh, our, our conservation, of course, is our primary. We want to keep that, keep the soils in place and keep them producing to the max. Uh, there's seeding programs, there's fertilizer programs, there's lime programs, all the things you would expect from the farm. Now, here is where we're having to we're coming on into a different angle. The urban ag, that is the, and this is where the uh, where I think the homeowners associations are going to have to change. They're going to have to become more tolerant of people having small agriculture, that is small gardens, and even chickens and, and small poultry in subdivisions mm-hmm. uh, I think that's going uh, it's going to be very important in the near future uh, then what we call non-ag cooperators and that goes from every everyone a non-ag cooperator could be from Procter and Gamble down to uh, to, to, to Bill's home in, in, his, in where he lives uh, the you, you the indiscriminate use of pesticides is going to be a conservation issue more so than it has been in the past. Um, the are, are those regulations mostly federal or are they mostly state? Well, we have state regulations. We have local, and in Jefferson County, we have local regulations, and then we also have federal. And it's even nicer when they all come together. Can local trump state or federal? Not necessarily. They can if they don't get caught. <laughs> That's a good answer to everything. Yeah, let me go pesticides very quickly. You said it's a <laughs> conservation issue. Uh, I know it's a water quality issue, very I'm, much so. Well, we Are consider you, that conservation. Okay, that's my question. You're merging the two. Okay. For instance, uh, the issue of uh, it's not so much around here yet, but a pesticide called dicamba. It's used for soy in uh, the in the Midwest. It's used for soybean production, but it drifts. And it, ki- it it kills nearly everything it touches, except the uh, soybeans that are genetically engineered to withstand it. Uh, these are things that got to be controlled, or at least monitored effectively. Now that problem was uh, came to light in Arkansas a couple of yes. so years ago. Was wiping out all the farms downwind of where the mm-hmm. the farm is actually applying the application. Yes, it's called drift. Yeah. yeah. And we have we have that as as well in I've, I've seen it in Jefferson County because the land across the road from where I where I live used to be an orchard and now it's a corn and soybean field, and I have lo- I've lost a garden because of pesticide drift. Uh, how concerned are you about solar farms in regards to reducing the amount of plowable acreage? Well, you know it's uh, like a solar farm, like a subdivision. It grows best where crops grow best. Very few people want to put a solar farm on a mountainside. At least I haven't seen it yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, very few people can run a combine on a mountainside. Although, yes, in the far west, they. And when I was with Alice Chalmers, we used to sell the hillside model. That was for harvesting beans in the Pacific Northwest. Had a terrain leveling system to it, so it can be done. Just costs a whole lot more. So, what is your, as the supervisor, what is your attitude toward solar farms? Well. There's definitely a place for it. Um, we're hoping what what 
and I would have to just speak personally on this because it has not been addressed. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, Jefferson County probably is, I think Putnam may be considered for a couple of solar farms, and Mason County, I think it may be coming to them. But I think Jefferson County is the first one to be approached for a solar farm, and I think there's one proposed for Berkeley. Up in up yeah, here, the old oh, DuPont, DuPont property. DuPont, exactly right, yeah. Um, well, of course, DuPont wasn't agriculture, so that uh, makes that an academic issue. Um, what's the highest and best use for the land? Uh, does it grow houses? Does it grow solar panels? If you haven't been up Route 15 north by Emmitsburg lately, yeah. that became well, a solar farm well, right by Mount St. Mary's. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, by Mount St. Mary's, and then on uh, the Woodsboro Pike going up to Hanover. To 26, and, I think. Uh, let's see, that's 194, I believe, going up yeah, to Hanover, to Littlestown. Yeah. Uh, on both sides of the Mason-Dixon line, there's uh, half a dozen solar farms. Mm -hmm. So, Danny, as as the soil as the Eastern Panhandle um, Soil Conservation District supervisors, what counties does that encompass then? And do we have the it, despite the the decrease in the number of orchards and farms, do we still have the highest percentage of um, of those entities? Um, in West Virginia or no? Well, your first question, mm -hmm. uh, the Eastern Panhandle Conservation is Morgan, Berkeley, and Jefferson okay, County. Three. The mm -hmm. next district over is uh, six counties of Potomac Valley, that's Mineral, Hampshire, Hardy, Grant, and Pendleton. Okay. Um, and we, we're working more together than we ever have before because it's essential. Uh, the other thing to mention, we don't have as much here in the Eastern Panhandle, though we do have one that's being worked on now, is the uh, water impoundment dams that were put in in the late 40s and, the, and through the 50s and early 60s. They're coming up on the end of their useful life around the state of West Virginia. There are 171 of them, and 169 of them need major work. Well, there is one up here in Berkeley Springs. Warm Springs Number 7 is being reconstructed right now as we speak. Um, we've got some problems such as in Mineral County, and of course that's Potomac Valley's mm -hmm. problem. The people built a subdivision right at the foot of one of them, and it's starting, it, it, that is, it, it's impaired. Uh, it hasn't, no, there's no damage done yet, but that was, there's going to be a lot of money has to be spent to correct all that. And people are building roads against those dams and such. And nationwide, Dan, at least on the East Coast, a lot of those dams have been removed, been taken out. Is that any? Is that under consideration here? Uh, in West Virginia, I would. I've not. I, I don't have good information to address that. But uh, giving an opinion, I would say in West Virginia, that is not a practical thing, because go back. If I may uh, digress you back to 2016, when that first uh, series of bad floods went through in June. If those dams in Nicholas, Webster, and Greenbrier counties in that area had not worked as well as they did, I don't want to think what the loss of life and property would have been. So I don't think for West Virginia, and I would even say for, West, for Western Pennsylvania, I don't think taking those dams out is a practical solution because we'd be back to what we were having in the 30s and 40s with uh, flash floods. Sure. Dan Lutz is our guest. He is the Eastern Panhandle Conservation District uh, Supervisor. Uh, what is your crossover with farmland protection? Uh, farmland protection monitors our activities, and we monitor theirs, but I don't have much interaction with them, at least uh, not, from, not from the work that I'm doing. Who contacts you with questions in regards to uh, things they need information for or some type of ruling on? On who? With your job, like uh, oh, if, if somebody has is it Joe Farmer? Yes, uh, anybody, anybody, everyone's a constituent. All three of you are constituents. Uh, if I get a question from you, I'm obligated to get the best answer for you I can. What's the most prominent question that you get? What's the biggest issue right now? Oh, biggest issue right now. Uh, Oddly enough, the, uh, it's uh, uh, agriculturally, the uh, get it, getting the programs in place. We've had to extend a couple of our programs because it was either, for a while, it was too wet for anybody to work the, the ground. Now it's too dry. Sure. Are you under Department of Agriculture? West Virginia Department of okay, Agriculture. Okay, so you're a, fe now, you're a state program and not a federal program. Right. Now, 
where we come in with federal, we we also get uh, what we call 319 money from the Chesapeake Bay program, which is very important to us here in the Panhandle. Why is that? Well, uh, West Virginia and the Eastern Panhandle being a part of it contributes 10% of the total load to the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, You're talking about sediment load now. Well, this is water load. Water load, okay. Right. And, that, and of course, West Virginia and the District of Columbia are leading the seven Chesapeake Bay jurisdictions in the reduction of nitrogen, potassium, and phosphate pollution. Pennsylvania is trying to get back on board because they've let theirs go. Is it, let me ask you this question because this happened a couple of years ago, uh, I guess, in the Anacostia, which feeds into the bay. Right. right. So a sewage pipe had been broken for I don't know how long, and they were mm. just dumping raw sewage into the Anacostia, which is then flowing into the bay. In the meantime, this was probably eight, ten years ago. Uh, it seemed like there was an incredible amount of attention being paid on West Virginia and what West Virginia was floating down the river. Well, right there in Washington, D.C.'s literal backyard, Raw sewage is getting pumped right down the river for I don't know how long it was till somebody finally discovered this. Does stuff like that frustrate you in your job? Well, because it frustrated me listening to that report. When I look at what we have in the Eastern Panhandle, and then compare it with what I've seen in uh, Southern West Virginia, especially in the Tug Fork Valley, I feel pretty good about what we've accomplished because I have not. Se- I'm, not, I'm certain they're there, but I haven't seen any open discharge pipes going into a stream in the eastern panhandle. You go down to, through Maitwan and uh, <coughs> Kermit and those places, that's all you see is direct discharge pipes. And uh, the Tug Fork River seems to be the repository for, for uh, worn out tires. Mm-hmm. So we do we have that? Yes, but not as much. Mm-hmm. And thanks to the Stubblefield Institute grant, there are many people are picking up that uh, litter along the roadside. And well, and they're such. doing that, and also Clint Hogman has done a great yes. job. Of, I didn't uh, mean to slight Clint. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, the stream pickup. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dan, uh, we have about a minute left, or whatever. Is there any information you want to make sure you get out as your position of supervisor to our listeners that they need to know about? Well, I, uh, supervisor, I'm just going to make it make make this both hat wear both hats at the same time. What I'd like to see is West Virginia come into the 21st century. For instance, we have the talent and we have the people that are intelligent enough to be able to come up with the with the new ideas and new techniques and new technology. We need the venture capital and the support. And that's why with the Via Satellite magazine there, I showed you the article about students Mm -hmm. for the exploration and development of space. This is one place I'd like to see a start here in the eastern panhandle and be the bellwether for the state. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate it.